to the British Society of Victoria, uh, I can see a lot of uh, new faces. Okay, so for me what's really important I mean, being a Buddhist, taking Buddhism as my working hypothesis, which is like how I like to say it, you know, it's really important to, um, to kind of hear it in the most practical way. And part of the problem for us, like in living, you know, coming from a contemporary culture, let's say us English-speaking Australians who've been brought up with, say, Christianity or Judaism or nothing, at all, you know, no religion at all, it's... And, you know, and we speak in, I mean, currently we know we all speak in very different ways. But as soon as we hear something from, from the Buddha, whether it's, you know, a thousand years or two thousand or more years ago, and because it's coming from other cultures, it's, let's say it's not our culture, we, 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 and because secondly it's spiritual teachings, it's religion, we tend to not hear it properly. We tend to mystify it, you know. And I think part of that is because... If we had been brought up in a Christian background, certainly I was. I mean, my school was just down the road. I went to Glen Burke Road, that Catholic convent on Burke Road, Glen Iris. Um, you know, you, I was brought up as a Catholic, and that means God was my creator. That means I had faith in God. I, my job was not to prove that God was right. That would be considered very rude, you know. So my job was to have faith in God. And so the information that comes out of God is surely something, therefore, is from on high, and as I said, is to be believed. So we tend to have that view. Even if we're good little Buddhists, we tend to have this view of its religion, it's spiritual, and it tends to be above ordinary life, and therefore we tend to think you kind of have faith in it and believe in it, you know, which is fine. But actually the Buddhist one, as we realise, as we know, Mr Buddha, Lord Buddha, was this regular guy, you know, who came out of this amazing Indian tradition. It was just recently, I remember reading the Dalai Lama, he said that it was these extraordinary Indians 3,000 years ago who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. So I think certainly in our culture, you know, our Judeo-Christian culture, we go back to the Greeks and the Romans, we know nothing about the Indians, you know. So then these are extraordinary beings, these are remarkable, ingenious, remarkable thinkers, you know, who came up with, they're the ones who came up with this, this, this extraordinary technique that we know broadly these days as mindfulness meditation. But actually it's a psychological skill that as we... Uh, that as we know, when you develop it to the fullest, it enables you to go to these subtler levels of your own mind. As we know, Lord Buddha doesn't talk about some spirit or some soul. He doesn't talk like that. He's talking about our consciousness, our mind, and we're going to talk about this tonight. So what he means by that is the workings of whatever goes on inside us. And as we know, this technique enables you to access subtler levels of your consciousness that we in the materialist models don't even posit as existing, you know. That's why we think it's so mystical. But it's the mind, it's consciousness. And these amazing beings cultivating this technique, and then what they did was within their own mind at these subtle levels, having harnessed the crazy energy of this mind, they, were, they literally mapped the mind. So still today, wherever people study Buddhist, Buddhism seriously, the model of the mind, the psychological view of the mind, according to the Lord Buddha, is coming from these amazing Indians more than 3,000 years ago. I mean, you know, we tend to think in the arrogant West that we, we Westerners with Mr. Freud started psychology. I mean, load of rubbish, I'm sorry. So Mr. Buddha, Lord Buddha, is this extraordinary being who then 500 years later came out of that tradition and then, as we know, diverged in his own direction, specifically in relation to his own intense, deep, experiential findings himself and his own mind about reality, about the self, about what is true, what is not, and crucially, about this mind of ours and what its potential is. So actually, it's, it's really, in that fundamental way, it's got zero to do with being a belief system. Zero. Zero. It's an intense, experiential, you know, hands-on application of, this, of the methodology of the Buddha that you're practicing yourself so that you can become exactly as the Buddha says you can become. It's not a question of believing in something. It's a question of doing the job, you know. And this is something that we don't tend to think of when we're spiritual, even if we're Buddhists. We tend not to. We tend to be all holy and put our hands like this. And, and I'm not being rude about that. But we often get, don't get past the, the, you know, the, 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 the kind of physical parts of it. And then we, indeed, we have faith in Buddha. We have faith in the Dharma, faith in the Sangha, so on. But actually, if we're really doing the job properly, as one of my teachers said, what that means is you're learning to be your own therapist. And that's not a joke. It's not just some clever marketing ploy. It's actually technically true because Buddha deals with the mind. He doesn't use the word psychology. We coined that. It's from Greek, you know. He didn't know that word. But it's dealing with the mind. We must never underestimate that. And the trouble is, though, because, you know, when you look at the pictures of, of Buddhists and the holy meditators, there is the holiness there. It's got that religious component, you know. And I, look, I'm a nun. I just sang a prayer. So we can be given for sort of confusing these. But actually, it's extraordinarily sophisticated psychology. And I mean that seriously. 
I'm not just trying to be clever, you know. So the way to listen to this and to apply it has to be so practical. Yeah, but what's interesting, as we all know, which is not how we are in the world, Buddhist psychology comes hand in hand with the practice of morality, with the practice of abiding by the laws of karma. And this is where it gets kind of gets so-called religious sounding. But equally there, it's not religious in the, in the sense of belief. So understanding Lord Buddha's ama amazing views about how the world comes into being, what is a person, who we are, what is happiness, what is suffering, that's the laws of karma. And again, this, because Buddha's not a, Buddha a, doesn't apposite a creator, this is not a belief system. Karma isn't, as far as Buddha's concerned, and this indeed came also from the Indians, but Buddha's perfected and, and kind of you know, ex uh, expresses his own take on it, that karma's a natural law. It's a natural law like botany or gravity. It's not a thing to believe in. You can have faith. Faith is a major important word. Look at the word confidence, confide, the Latin, with trust. But it's got a very different application in the Buddhist approach. And that's because Buddha is not a creator and doesn't assert one. So we might know that technically, but we've got to join the dots. What does it mean, you know? So if I am a... Okay, if you've got a cookbook, you can know. You, the first question has to be, I wonder where this information came from. Well, the normal deduction is the author is a person who knows these recipes and is telling you their experience. That's, that's the best. Or if not that, then maybe they're telling you their mother's recipes and they're being humble and they're, you know, they're reporting on their mummy's recipes. That's perfect. Or the other option is that they're lying and they made it all up or they stole it. I mean, there's only those four options. <laughs> so now what's religious material? If it's Catholic, it's indeed somebody writing it, but we ought to trust that it's coming from the, pro the proper authentic views of the Catholic Church, otherwise you can't call it Catholic. And where does that all come from? It comes from on high, from, on, from God, from revelation. Well, that's not Buddha's deal. It's coming from his own experience. So it's not a joke to say that if I were Einstein here telling you about relativity, you know it didn't come from revelation. You'd chuck me out the door if I said it did. You know I didn't have a vision of it. You know I didn't have a dream. You know I'm not speculating. You should hope, hope I'm not. So you know it's come from my experience. And all I'm doing is presenting it to you. Now I say, over to you, baby. It's up to you to prove it's to be true and to experience it for yourself. Because you'd be very shocked if I said you better believe it. So Buddha, I'm sorry, is identical. And I'm not kidding. It's identical. But this, even as Buddhists, it's surprising to us. Because we tend to take it only at the religious level, you know? So we're all different, okay, we're, we can do what we like. We're, in the end, we are the boss and we can take it on board. And you could argue believing in what Buddha says is not bad. It'll lead you in the right direction. Good on you. It's great. He talks about morality, goodness, kindness. You can't go wrong there. But the Buddha's deal about what we can accomplish, you know, so as we know in the Lord Buddha's teachings, we've got the, the teachings that say we can achieve our own liberation. And then as we know in the Mahayana teachings, we can also achieve, you know, we can add bodhicitta to the mix and become this enlightened Buddha. So they're, they're basically, basically both these results that Buddha says we can accomplish. So to accomplish a result, you don't just cross your fingers and have faith. You can't become a phys physicist by having faith in, phys you know, in physics. You, can't, you don't just believe in mathematics. You have to accept that it's a valid thing. You check the sources and then you start to study it. And so what you're doing when you study something, you're experiencing it as your own truth and that means you're verifying it. Well, that's how you apply Buddha's teachings. Okay, of course, because we know the Lord Buddha says we've got more than one life. This we have to prove to, well, don't believe it. So this means we have to understand what he means. What is the mind? How does it function? What is a person? Who are we? Where we come from, you know? So we, as we all know, in all the traditions, it is there available to us, the text, the, the, the amazing literature from over the centuries from the great thinkers and the great philosophers and the great meditators, Buddha's, Buddha's teachings. And that's up to us whether we want to engage in it or not, you know? It's, but it's all there. It's all there for us. Because we should have confidence when we do it, you know? So, okay, what is Buddha saying? Well, as I said, he's not a creator. He's a person who's from his own experience, it, the depth of his own mind, using these amazing techniques these amazing Indians before him came up with. He has found that the fundamental finding of the Buddha is that the delusions, the neuroses, the ego, the fears, the dramas, the, 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 the ridiculous rubbish in us, which we're going to talk about, which we in our culture totally take as a given. And that is what? Anger, fear, depression, jealousy, low self-esteem, attachment, you know, unhappiness, stress, anxiety. This stuff that we totally take for granted, we totally think is at the core of our being, and we completely assume are natural to a human being. So natural that we would think that you'd be unnatural if you didn't have them. Well, Buddha's simple point, his simple point is that this stuff 
is adventitious. Now, I don't, use a di I don't use that word much in my life. I need my dictionary. What that'll tell me is that this stuff is not at the core of my being, that therefore it can be removed. Now, those words are so simple, but we can't even hear it. It's too shocking. If I go to one of you as a therapist and I say, would you please be, be so kind as to give me methods to get rid of all anger, all attachment, all fear, all jealousy, continuously and permanently, you'll think I'm mentally ill. Seriously. Because there's no model like that in our world. So that's why we hear it as religion and superstitious and just mystical. Oh, yeah, that's just the Buddhists. That's how they talk. You know, that's really insulting. So, I mean, it's quite a shocking concept, quite radical. There's no psychology in our culture that says that. There's no view of the mind that says that. Because we give equal status, don't we, to anger and neurosis and fear and depression as we do to love and compassion. So, sure, we want a nice balance and not be too neurotic. We accept that. But you, almost you could argue that Lord Buddha's, you know, his view of what natural is, of, of, is when you rid the, rid the mind of all the rubbish, when you've achieved your own nirvana, you've achieved your own liberation from suffering. Because these are the causes of it. This is Buddhist deal, and this is Buddhist, this is Buddhist view of the mind. It's a really intense, very radical concept. Don't just believe it, or don't just reject it. But that's why we have to comprehend it. Then we can begin to apply it. It's kind of reasonable. So, but to understand that, it's not, not so easy, because the way he frames the mind, and again, this model is coming from the Hindus. He got his own variations on it. They're the ones who mapped the mind, these amazing Indians. And I don't mean the brain here. They never thought of the brain back then. They mapped the internal cognitive process, this, this consciousness, this mind of ours. This is really what Buddha deals with. This is right down beyond all the holy parts, beyond all the, all, this is right down the essence of what being a Buddhist is, working on your own mind, lessening the delusions, unraveling your emotions, comprehending them, and slowly changing them, lessening them, and growing the good stuff. It's not in a sense that concept is not complicated. It's just that the, the, the degree to which we can do this is insane when we compare it with the, with the materialist view and we, and we compare it with the usual conceptions we all have about what, I can, what I'm capable of. Because I think every one of us, without being taught, just assume anger, anxiety, worries, fears, are these natural parts of us, what to do, it's just the way life is, you know? But the, the point that Buddha's making is that we can get rid of this stuff. Get rid of it. Hear the words. This is quite shocking. So if, that, if, if we're going to try and not just have faith in it, but comprehend intellectually even what he means by that, we need to understand how the mind works. You know, I think Western scientists will be blown out if they bothered to posit the possibility that their mind mightn't be their brain, which is what Buddha's positing here and to actually study the sophisticated teachings in Buddhist psychology, studied in all the traditions coming right back from the beginning, about the way this mind works, meaning the thoughts and feelings and emotions and unconscious and subconscious, meaning the cognitive process itself, not the brain, not discussing the physical. They'd be fascinated, you know, we'd be fascinated. But it's quite, it's quite a fascinating model, it's very interesting, you know. So let's just look at it briefly, and then see how we can apply this, see what the meaning, the implications are for us in our daily lives of learning to deal with our emotions, unravel our emotions, you know? So, okay, the Buddhist model of the mind is deceptively simple. Well, first of all, and already this is fascinating, this really gives us an insight into how the mind works. We can say, we first of all, we've got sensory consciousness. Sensory consciousness. First of all, the word broadly speaking in Buddhism, mind and consciousness, very broadly speaking, can be used synonymously, okay? So, so the first, part of, first thing about the mind is it's not physical. This is fundamental. If it is proved to be true that Buddha is mistaken, that the mind in fact is not, not physical, then the whole of Buddhism actually collapses into a heap of complete absurdity. So in order to really take Buddhism on board in our lives, if we're serious about it, you know, like, this is why I, like, I really say this sincerely, I take this as my working hypothesis. I would rather say that than I believe in it, because we can get intellectually very lazy. Oh, yeah, I believe in this. Oh, I believe in that. You know, it's like, but it's, I mean, it's not enough to say this. So I'd rather say it's my working hypothesis, which means I'm trying to engage in it, you know, which is how we ought to be if we say we're Buddhists. So, okay, his first point about the mind, of consciousness, is it is not physical. This doesn't mean we haven't got a brain. This doesn't mean the brain doesn't play a role. That's why this is amazing conversations that have been happening the last 30 plus years with the Dalai Lama and his mob and some of the best brains in the West about psychology and neuroscience. That's what's so fantastic that he initiated these conversations because there's such a gap 
in the seeming, the seeming gap between the materialist views and the, and, the, and the Buddhist ones, but actually, you know, unknown to many of the materialist scientists. There's an astonishing level of understanding that is, again, in all the traditions, certainly in the Tibetan Buddhist one, which is my tradition, in the, the, the Buddhist monastic university system, but this is in all the Buddhist traditions. People study this stuff in depth. So there's these marvellous conversations now, and since a lot of the experiments they've been doing on the brains of meditators now finding the greatest, as one scientist said, the greatest finding of the 20th century, that we're not stuck with the brain we're born with. Well, I'm so happy. In other words, we can change our mind. Well, I'm, I'm very happy we're catching up with Buddha, you know. How fantastic. We can now, you know, the, the, we, 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 mater we materialists can now get to see we can prove it. And one of the, I mean, one of the, the people whom they did exper uh, um, experiments on, a French monk, Mathieu Ricard, a Tibetan Buddhist monk, he was simply thinking about compassion, nothing cosmic. Forget emptiness, he wasn't doing that. He's meditating on, on compassion. People could see radically it changed his brain. In other words, how you think affects the physical. Brand new idea for us in the West, it's marvellous. So there these, are these wonderful conversations and all this stuff's published, which is really great, you know. So anyway, Lord Buddha's point, fundamental mind or consciousness is not physical, first. Second, it is not the handiwork of your parents, which is one view, you're created by your parents, or a creator, which is the other view. They're the two main models in the world, let's face it. Either you believe it, you know, you believe in God, or you believe your mummy made you. We don't think it's a belief, but it, but it is. Buddha would argue with it. He says, your mother didn't make you. Your mother gave you a body. How kind mummy and daddy were. They worked very hard to get that body of yours. But they did not give you a mind, not for the Buddha, not one atom of your mind was given to you by your parents. I mean, this initially is shocking. Even if we're good little Buddhists, we still buy into this view, you know? But we want to take Buddha seriously. He's, he's saying, no, they didn't, in fact, give you mind. So what is mind referring to? This word mind, consciousness, what are they referring to? Well, the entire spectrum of your inner being, your intellect, your thoughts, feelings, emotions, unconscious, subconscious, instinct, intuition, the entire spectrum of our inner being. And to, as we've suggested, to levels that we don't even posit is existing, levels of consciousness that do not depend upon the brain. This is fundamental to understand. Not some mysterious cosmic trip, you know. This is practical. Mind is not physical at any level, and at subtler levels, which you, what you accomplish when you get this single point of concentration done, this Indians invented, you are accessing subtler levels of your consciousness that we don't even posit as existing in the West because your brain is not necessary at that level. If you were to see a person who'd accomplished this samadhi, they would look like they were dead. Very simple, because they've gone beyond the sensory and the conceptual. This is fundamental to understand. The next point is then, if I'm not the product, if I'm the handiwork of another person, which is the view we all have in the world, either a creator or mummy, then where did I come from? Pretty obvious question. Well, guess what? Dalai Lama says it. It's like self karma is like self-creation. It's a good term. Nothing wrong. So the Buddha's deal is that our consciousness not being physical is this kind of continuity of mental moments. Think of it this way, you know, happening every millisecond. In absolutely in relation, certainly at the gross levels, to this body. So if you track your consciousness back, if you had perfect memory, you know, it's, even the term in Buddhist psychology is mental continuum. This continuity of mental moments of thoughts and feelings and emotions, which, by the way, those words refer to all your intellect, not just that, but also all your neurotic emotions, all your psychosis and your, and your craving to kill people or your craving to eat food all the time or your being good at football or being good at music or being good at mathematics. All of these tendencies of ours, this is our mind, you know, our consciousness. So this river of mental moments, if you tracked it back in a perfect way without, you know, with perfect memory, you'd know you'd keep going back to the first second of conception. The basic law of cause and effect. Where did this moment of my mind come from? Well, guess what, a previous moment. Oh, I see, where'd that come from? Well, guess what, a previous moment. Where'd that come from? And you keep tracking back, you're gonna to get to the first second of conception, inexorably. And then what? The second before that, egg was in mummy's body, sperm was in daddy's body, where was your consciousness? Clearly at a subtle level, but it came from a previous moment. And not many weeks before that, the Buddha's teachings say, and it's dealt with a great depth in the literature, it was in another body. And before that, in a previous body. This is not some hippie trippy belief in Buddhism. This is Buddha's view. This is his observation from his own direct observation. Buddha would say, this is how things are. Like I said, he's not telling us to believe him. He's stating his case, you know, which he's allowed to do. You know, it's up to you to go find it out. Verify it for yourself by doing the job he did. So your consciousness keeps going back. 
you know, because it's a product of cause and effect. You can't have a first moment. You just can't. We all want a first moment. It's irrational. Well, he says, what do you want a first moment for, you know? If you have the law of cause and effect, at any given moment, whatever you point to, including a moment of my mind, is the effect of a previous cause. Well, how can you ever point to a thing that's the effect of no cause? You cannot, as mad as it sounds to us. This is Buddha's deal, you know. He's found this to be so, from his own intense, extraordinary work, you know, internally. So, okay, on the basis of this marvellous technique these Indians came up with, which Lord Buddha uses, which is still currently used by all Buddhists, if they're learning this meditation skill, concentration, they mapped the mind, basically, internally. And there's still, as I said, the model, the model of the mind, there are variations of it in the different traditions, is still based upon the initial findings of these remarkable Indians, you know. So, what is this model of the mind? How does, how does our mind work, very roughly? Well, like I said, first we have sensory consciousness. And then we have mental consciousness. And already this is very telling, the distinction between these. You know, so like I always use this example. If I picked up that cup and I go, oh, what a pretty cup. And I would say that. The yellow is very pleasing. I like the dragons, you know. What a pretty cup. We would all be forgiven for thinking that my eye consciousness cognizes a pretty cup. This is not how we all assume it in the daily life, isn't it? Our senses are massively important to us, aren't they? That's how we interact with the world, through our senses, you know. As Lama Yeshi said, we make the body the boss. But for the Buddha, our sensory consciousness is really deceptive. In, and not only that, and this is the point now, sensory consciousness is profoundly limited in its capacity for cognition. In fact, again, he studied this in depth in Buddhist psychology, eye consciousness, has, it, there is always this consciousness or mind at whatever level, gross or subtle, sensory or mental. It's always it's referred to as subject. And then it always has an object. Object not meaning physical, but that which that mind cognizes. So here, the, the object of cognition of my eye consciousness is precisely two things. Colour and shape. That's it. Eye consciousness is like, they're like dumb animals. There's no capacity to cognize more than that. So then obviously we've got to ask the question, where does... Oh, what a pretty cup come from. Well, guess what? And I love this analogy and it's perfect. The eye consciousness goes there and then, and I'm not kidding, quicker than Google, and I really mean this, <laughs> quicker than Google, our mental consciousness is accessed. And this is, as Lama Zopa puts it, that's where the workshop is. This is Lord Buddha's expertise, the amazing descriptions of the way our mental consciousness works. This is his brilliant expertise the way the mental consciousness works. This is where the workshop is. This is where all our memories are, all our feelings, all our emotions, all the causes of suffering, all the causes of happiness, all our opinions made up over our lifetime and indeed coming in from previous lifetimes, Buddha would say. We come fully programmed from the first second of conception with all of our tendencies and viewpoints and dramas, you know. This is Buddha's deal. This is the meaning of karma. So, the fascinating point for the Buddha is there's not a millisecond of anything any sentient being ever experiences through their senses or indeed their mental consciousness that goes astray. Everything is stored in here. Everything is stored in here. So clearly, the little bit that I can access, because we all have bad memories, don't we? You know, the second my eyes go there, I haven't lost my memory enough yet. I recognise as a cup, I recognise as yellow, I recognise as dragons. I've made up my opinions in my life about what I think is pretty and out comes the opinion virtually simultaneously. Oh, what a pretty cup. This is, this is already very powerful. This is telling us that eye consciousness, ear consciousness, like I'm a fan of Miles Davis, still. I hear that one note of trumpet. I go, wow, Miles Davis. But what's happening is my quick Google, my memory is still there. I hear that sound, first note I can recognise. Trumpet, Miles Davis, that song, that tune, that year, you know, because I'm familiar, all stored here. So all, basically, this is Buddha's deal that what goes on in our mental consciousness is a bunch of opinions. This is one really valid way of talking about the whole of Buddhist approach to life. And what he's saying is this, that some of those opinions are a load of rubbish. He calls them delusions. He calls them disturbing emotions, afflictive emotions, unhappy emotions. He would have liked the term neuros neuroses, I'm quite sure. And this is the first category of the three categories of states of mind in our mental consciousness. There are no, there's no fourth category. And these are not moralistic labels. These are technical. The first category are neurotic or deluded or negative states of mind. 
non-virtuous states of mind. The second category are the virtues, the positive states of mind. So, for example, anger, attachment, jealousy, they're an example of the first. And we're going to go into these, this is the point, we have to learn to know what their characteristics are. And then we have to, the key job of being a Buddhist, unraveling our emotions, doing this job the Buddha says we can do, is that we have to distinguish them from the other ones, the so-called virtues, the positive states. And what are they? We all know them. Love, compassion, kindness, generosity, hardly a no-brainer. So this is the stuff the Buddha deals with in Buddhist psychology. You know, in, our, in the West, we've got all these brand new concepts of this, this, and I be bipolar and schizophrenic and this, that, and personality disorder and low this and something that and whatever, you know, these terms, brand new. Buddha hasn't changed his story in 2,500 years. He uses the same words, and they're dealt with an incredible depth and subtlety in the descriptions in the literature, so it's fascinating. Whereas we just tend to think it was just kind of feelings, you know, big deal. Oh, yeah, I'm a bit angry. Oh, yeah, I'm a bit jealous. You know, but these are, for Buddha, these are our... What are the terms they use? Um, person, what do they say? Per, what, are, what are terms we use in uh, uh, mental illnesses? That's a great term. I think Buddha would really have liked that. These are our mental illnesses, he says. And he says we're all mentally ill. It's just a question of degree. And I'm not kidding when I say that. I'm using modern terms. But it sounds shocking to us. Because when we hear mental illness, we immediately think of somebody way over there who's got a serious problem and is not like me. Do you understand my point? But this is Buddha's point. So we listen to his teachings properly and use these words that we understand and put them onto what he's saying. These neuroses are the source, he says, of all our suffering. This is a shocking concept. We don't think that in the West, not in the slightest. These are, so we have to unpack them and know them deeply and well. How, and we have, what we have to do is then unpack and unravel them and distinguish them from the positive ones because right now they're a great big soup all mixed together. One big soup of emotion. And we can't tell one bit from another until it's way too late, you know. Now, the third category is really fascinating. They're, they're simply called neutral, not because they're not important. It's because I like to call these the mechanics of the mind. And remember, we're not talking the brain. These are called concentration, good memory. There's diff many different ones. Vigilance, alert. there's many terms in Buddhist psychology. We recognise these all. But we're thinking they're part of our brain and they can, that's okay. But these are cognitive parts of the cognitive process. And these are the mechanics of the mind. that They're called neutral because they're neither virtuous in their nature nor non-virtuous. Now, strictly speaking, and in the different Buddhist literature and the different traditions, this word mindfulness, you know, which is a massive one these days, you know, one, in, in one understanding of the mind, that's just one of the many states of mind, like love, compassion, attachment, anger, concentration. You know, it's, it's actually referring to the ability to not forget what you're doing from moment to moment. So it's not wholly in its nature. We often use it like that. It's simply referring to one of the parts of our mind. So knowing, or for not forgetting what you're doing from moment to moment, excuse me, a sniper needs that. A thief needs that. Dogs need that. A communist needs that. It's not wholly in any way or form. It's simply a technical part of our mind that enables us not to forget what we're doing. So clearly a meditator needs it. Do you see what I'm saying here, people? So we've really got to unpack these terms and get very grounded and down to earth about them. We, we're so, we love to be so holy. I mean, please forgive me when I say that. I'm not trying to be rude. Well, I usually say that when I am being rude, so then never mind. <laughs> but get my point. Please hear it. Are we communicating? Okay. So I'll say a bit more, then I want you to ask questions, okay? So, okay, so let's now, let's now get to the point. Now let's look at the contents of this mental consciousness. This is where the workshop is. This is what, this is what Lord Buddha's expertise is, coming from these amazing Indians. Okay. Let's look at the characteristics of the so-called negative ones, neurotic ones, deluded ones, these terms. Let's look at these. We recognize them. We know them upside down and back to front. Well, it's like, I like to say this. There's like a hierarchy of them, actually. And there are actually probably thousands. But, you know, when you study the Buddhist text, and this is in the, the, the Theravada and the Mahayana, it's all the same. It comes from the same source. There are variations in interpretations, and that's fine. There's good, lots of debating among Buddhists. That's very healthy. But the fundamentally... 
There's a text one that is studied that, that refers to 51 different states of mind. There are thousands, but they narrow it down to 51. Some of the negative, some of the positive, and indeed some of these neutral. And the crucial one about the neutral ones, concentration, mindfulness, alertness, all these different ones, they are trained to really be extraordinarily clear and sophisticated in concentration meditation. So that you can use this mind of incredible sharpness and clarity to do the job of unpacking and unraveling its contents so that we can lessen the neuroses and grow the positive and achieve this amazing liberation from suffering and its causes that Lord Buddha says we can. It's a practical thing, you know, and it's a really intense job if we're doing it properly. So, okay, that means we have to distinguish negative from positive. Again, these are technical terms, please. Okay, what are the characteristics of the negative ones? Okay, well, as I mentioned, there's like a hierarchy. I oh, to use that term. So the root, okay, okay, first of all, there are two main characteristics of these unhappy states of mind. These are fundamental. And these are both indicated by two of the synonyms. One of them is the term disturbing emotion. Well, check the last time you were jealous. You don't go, oh, wow, you know, I was jealous yesterday and it was just great. <laughs> Do we? We know it is heartbreaking. Well, check the depression. Anger. We defend our right to be angry, but we know it's disturbing if we're being humble enough, you know. Arrogant. Low self-esteem. Anxiety. I mean, just think of these half a dozen. We know these unbelievably, we're so familiar, you know. They're clearly disturbing. To you, right there, the very having of them. And it's obvious that on the basis of these, we do nutty things, do we not, with our body and speech, which impacts upon others. Look at the world, you know, so clear. So the other term, this is so, and this is fascinating, if we can get the meaning of this one, we're really on track with understanding Buddha's real essential point of why we suffer. And this is not how we talk in the West. And this term is the term delusion. It's such a fascinating word. Now, part of the problem here is all the different translators from the different traditions, everybody uses different words. So it's a real mess. You, know, you don't know the original, to either the Pali or the, the Tibetan or the Sanskrit. You know? So it's really quite difficult. But this word here is, 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 is indicating the key function of these neuroses, of these disturbing emotions. And this is what is, is indefinitely covered in depth in, in the Buddhist literature about the mind, the commentaries. And that is, that, you know, like you know yourself, if someone accused you of being delusional, you'd be very offended, wouldn't you? Because you know they're accusing you of not being in touch with reality. Well, I tell you, that is bullseye for Buddha. That's exactly what he's saying. That is exactly, and I mean precisely what he's saying. In other words, the extent to which we are caught up in attachment, anger, jealousy, depression, low self-esteem, you name it, is the extent to which we, one, are disturbed, and two, out of sync with reality, lost the plot, up the creek without a paddle. <laughs> and these are the ones we have to look into. This is the hardest job, you know. These are the voices of ego, if you like. But see, part of our problem too, as soon as we hear this kind of talk, we, we kind of get guilty and feel bad because we think of them as sins. You know, I'm a bad person, you know. This is mistaken. We should be like the Christians who say, don't criticise a sinner, criticise a sin. It's a great term. So the, the kind of courage we need to look into our own minds and begin to recognise the jealousy, recognise the anger, the depression, the anxiety, without any fear and to own them. But this is immensely hard because in our culture, what do we do? When I'm angry, why are you angry, Rubina? Well, you know, Fred did that. He said this. He did that. It's his fault. Why are you jealous? It's exactly the same. Everything we say, I'm jealous, I'm this, I'm angry, I'm depressed. And then we go to my therapist. And then what she'll do, with respect to you, my therapist, we'll go back into the past, looking for like needles in haystacks, won't we? For the events that occurred that must have caused me to be angry, caused me to be jealous. Where did it begin? We're very addicted to that view. Now, Buddha is not complaining about that. He says, sure, look back in the past. But he says, you're missing the point. And this is really hard to hear. He says, the anger itself, the jealousy itself, the love and compassion and intelligence and kindness and goodness itself. Rabina, they are your qualities, darling. So when, you know, the world says, why are you angry, Rabina? Well, Fred, it's Fred's fault. Why are you jealous, Rabina? It's Fred's fault. Why are you happy, Rabina? Oh, that's Fred's fault too. He just gave me $100. <laughs> 
We blame the outside object, do we not? And this is the fundamental way that samsara works. Buddha's word of samsara, you know, is just a term for being caught up in suffering, being caught up in these neuroses and believing in their stories, you know. So we believe with our bones, this is ego's view, that suffering and happiness come from out there, literally. And, what, and that's what we spend all our lives involved in, do we not, in all day life, you know, trying to manipulate the outside world to get it to be just so, so that I can get happy and avoid suffering. And why do we do that? Because we believe the outside world is the cause of it. This is a default mode of the whole world and this is reinforced by our science and our psychology. It's a fact. But it's ego's view already. Don't blame your Catholic mother or your Jewish mother for this view. We come imprinted with this because it's the view of ego, you know, this dualistic view. So the Buddha's deal is, yes, the outside world plays roles. You can't argue with that. The cake is definitely a catalyst for your good feelings. Fred's punch is definitely a catalyst for your unpleasant feelings. That's the way the Buddhism would say it. But he says the key thing to look at is the state of mind itself. The state of mind itself. So when you say to Buddha, why am I angry? You say, well, darling, you must have been angry before. Oh, really? Well, why was I angry before? Well, I'm sorry, Rabina, you must have been angry before. But why was I angry before? Well, I'm sorry, honey, you must have been angry before that. And he will keep saying that. This is the way. It's rigorous and clear and shocking because we are addicted to believing it's out there. So we spend all our lives, do we not, trying to change out there. But all Buddha's saying, it's not complicated. It's change of mind is said, Rabina. It's okay, darling, you can do that. Even if you're not sure why it's happening, even if you don't have a clear view about karma and how it works, and that's very extensive in Buddhist literature, even if you don't even know that, don't worry about it. There's a saying, Buddha says, if you can change something, hey, please change it. But if you can't, then what? And this is why I really like to use, I'm going to go back to the mind a bit more, unraveling emotions, but I, I like to use extreme examples often because it really helps our mind. And, you know, and I, meant, I worked for like many years running Liberation Prison Project. I gave it up six years ago, but for about 15 years I ran it, starting in America as well as here. Dealing with prisoners all over the state, we had many mentors who would write to prison, we'd send books, I'd visit friends on death row, so on and so forth. So for me, this really very powerful experience of human beings, you know, who are in pretty, you know, lousy lives, ugly situation, treated like animals. Yeah, they've done naughty things, we'll join the club here. I bet the more naughty people aren't in prison than out, quite frankly, you know. So there's very, very moving examples for me of these human beings who have got nothing to look forward to in ordinary worldly terms, living in these garbage dumps of place, especially in America where the sentencing is so severe that the intensity of the numbers is so severe. It's really just outrageous, you know. So I remember this one woman, I read about this woman, I didn't know her. I read her memoir, I just read about her. She was on death row in Florida. And maybe 30 plus years ago, you know, she was, uh, you know, hitching with a hippie husband and a couple of hippie kids in Florida and they got picked up by two blokes and the blokes got stopped by the coppers. The blokes killed the coppers and blamed the hippies. So they're on death row. So being on death row for killing coppers, you're like an animal, basically. You're treated like an animal. You know, you're the worst evil person on earth. So the point is they were totally innocent. So can you only try and conceive of the process you'd have to go through? when you completely know this is going to end any minute because you realise that you, they made a mistake. But they keep not realising they made a mistake. And it goes from the courts to the judge to the jury to the police to the, you know, and then death row. You can't imagine the nightmare. The husband even got executed. You can't conceive of it, you know. So this woman, I think she wasn't a Buddhist, but she did yoga, different things. She was looking at different things. She's an astonishing human being. And she said, at, I got, I, at some point, I realised I couldn't change anything. But they couldn't take my mind from me. So I decided, I'm not a prisoner, I'm a monk, I'm not in a cell, I'm in a cave. Now we love to read words like this, it's so moving, but just put, put, put the pen, you know, join the dots. This is beyond outrageous. But this is exactly and precisely and simply what Buddha is saying. So take all the emotional overtones away, take all the moralism away, take all the blame, guilt, dramas, junk we add into this stuff, you know. Because in our world, we say she's allowed to be angry. We give a person a right to be angry. We're so demented in our world, we actually don't see the harm that our emotions are doing to us. And this is Buddha's key point. Forget karma, forget even why you're even in the, in the world in the first place, I don't care. Buddha's, one of Buddha's fundamental points, and the fact is to remember, he's not a creator. He doesn't own this stuff. 
We know this stuff. Buddha just is an expert at it. That's all. That's what I like to say. Do you understand? He, all he's saying is, Rabina, if you can start to see into your own mind and observe the unbearable pain of the jealousy and depression and anxiety and anger itself, here's some methods for you, baby, to change it. That's as simple as that. But because we're so full in our dualistic world of blame and guilt and, 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 you know, and, and punishment and reward, to even say to a person who's been badly done by that you know you can be less angry, you kind of like you said, as if you're blaming the victim. We think we have a right to be, blame, to be angry, to be hurt, to be out of our brains. You know? this is, and this, we can't get past that. But I'm allowed to be angry because I'm innocent. Well, Buddha said, you're right. You are right. But what good is being right? If you can get the people to believe you and get you out of prison, honey, go for it. But what if you can't? And that was what she found. I, they couldn't take my mind. Now, that to me is so astonishing, so intelligent, so courageous. Because look at the way we are in ordinary life, being accused of the tiniest wrong thing, thinking that someone at work mightn't like me. Look at the distress, the anxiety, the grief, the wish to get them to change because we can't stand. You know, these things. The pain is unbearable. But because we are addicted to the story about what happened out there that caused this, we don't look at this. We just look at that and spend all our energy trying to change it. So nothing wrong, Buddha says. If you can, you please do it. But it won't bring you happiness. It won't stop the suffering. That's all his point. It's practical. It's not religious. Please hear it. It's so practical. But it demands courage. It demands, and I mean it, intelligence to wade through all the emotional junk, you know. This, in other words, it's for your own sake. It's not holy. It's for your own sake. It's for your own sanity. She could see this and she did it. And luckily she got out after 17 years. How fortunate. At the same time, I read about some fellow, also on death row, also innocent, who was like normal, in our case, went completely out of his brain, screaming daily, I did not rape and kill that woman. He went completely demented. Now, we think, oh, isn't that terrible? The poor guy, you know, look at the suffering they've caused him. Look, we would never never occurs to us to think he could, we could maybe give him methods to help him change his mind. But he'd be insulted because we're so caught up in the victim mentality. We're so caught up in our right to be miserable, our right to be angry, our right to be depressed, our right to be jealous, and they define everything out there that we put the blame on. I'm not being heavy. I mean, I am being heavy, but that's how ego is. So we become paralysed, you know. So try not to hear it as religion. Well, I'm trying to be a good person. I'm going to give up blaming. I'm going to... Blah, blah, rubbish. Buddha's first point is, his whole first point about karma is that whatever any sentient being thinks and says and does first prog programs me, brings consequences for me right now, not to mention the future. This is Buddha's deal, you know. So we can hear that. So very interesting, in the very beginning stages of Buddha's practice, like junior school, grade one, you know, Buddha, like your grandma, like Jesus, like Allah, like a good communist, exhorts you to stop being mean to other people. Buddha basically gives you a little list of about seven things initially. Don't kill. Don't jump on the wrong partner. Don't take things that aren't given to you. Don't lie. Don't, 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 don't badmouth people behind backs. That's our favourite thing. We think it's a virtue to talk about politicians all day. <laughs> you know, don't, don't say harsh, use harsh language and don't wrap it on about nothing. Seven little things, not that many. He says, oh, excuse me. <laughs> he says, you know, he says, just, he says, okay, so he says back off and don't do those things. Now, the first question we should ask is, well, why not, please? Don't believe him. Now, this is a really interesting point. This is a massive point, actually. Jesus tells me to do that as well. And the reason, and I checked with my Jesuit priest friend, I asked him, I said, by definition, what is a sin? He said, by definition, a sin is doing what God said not to do. Now, that's completely reasonable because God's the boss. God's my creator. God is above everybody. God runs the show. God punishes and God rewards. That's perfect view. It's not Buddha's view, though. That's the point. But that's our view of goodness and badness, isn't it? Look at when you're in your mother's household. My mummy says, don't do that. Being a smarty pants, I will say, why not? And we know her answer, because I say so. <laughs> Is it not true? 
So that's a, actually, that's a philosophical position that implies a person above who calls the shots and who therefore punishes and rewards. Is not that our view of morality? Do you see my point? So when mummy doesn't see me do that naughty thing, I go, oh, great, I got away with it. Is that not how we think? Do you listen to this point? Now, if you go to your doctor and she, and she says, don't smoke, Rabina, I'll say, why not? Well, darling, it'll give you cancer. You, you don't say, who do you think you are telling me what to do? I can do what I like. You don't hear it like that. You hear it as kind advice because you know that smoking will harm you and she's being very kind to you. Isn't that true? You don't hear it as moralistic, like she's telling you, don't you dare smoke. So then, you know, and, th and then what happens is you don't go home and notice your doctor's not there, so out come your Marlboros, you know. <laughs> oh, I won't get cancer, she's not seeing me. That's dualistic, that's infantile. That's our view of good and bad. Buddha disagrees. He says it's a natural law, completely natural law. No one makes it up, no one mandates it, and no one punishes and no one rewards. That's why there's no good or, there's no reward or punishment in Buddhism. There's no reward or, or punisher. It's a shocking concept. We're not used to it. Even if we're good Buddhists, we still think of it like that. That's Buddha's point. It's quite shocking. I remember talking to some Lutherans, and very kind Lutherans in Kathmandu when I was at our centre, and we're discussing all the differences between Christianity and Buddhism. And I talked about karma and how there's no rewarder and punisher and creator. And he was quite shocked, and it was a very good point. He said, how come Buddhists are, there's no anarchy among Buddhists? Because the assumption is we need a boss. So even, you see, we, we treat Buddha that way. Oh, Buddha says I shouldn't kill. You don't bother asking why. He's not the boss. He's like your doctor advising you. He's not a creator. It's quite different. We've got to grow up and take responsibility. So take the advice of Buddha. So then why does he say? You've got to ask the question. Well, first point is this. For him, a negative action, a sin, if you like, isn't what he says is wrong. It's a natural law. He says, do your market research in this room. Ask people, do you like being killed, lied to, jumped upon by the wrong person? We know the answer is no. Look at the dogs and the rats as well. Their behaviour indicates the same thing. Well, Buddha says that's natural. Just look at the world. No one likes being harmed. That's the first level of a definition of a negative action, one that harms another. Pretty basic. But listen to this. The reason in the beginning he exhorts us not to do it is because guess what, Rabina, darling, if you kill and you lie and you steal and you blah, blah, you'll harm yourself. This is what we find so hard to hear. So, of course, he's talking long-term karma, and that's very sophisticated. But it's all in the literature. We can look into it, the mechanics of it, how it works in general. It's pretty intense. Self-creation, as Buddha says, if Dalai Lama says, effectively, Buddha's saying we create ourselves moment by moment. Not kidding. But even right now, I think, if we get this point, even now observing how when I kill and I lie and I steal and I rape and I, you know, cheat, not to mention be angry and jealous and depressed, just the states of mind, I am harming myself. When we get that, we'll become genius practitioners, I promise. But we're like babies. We want to be seen to be a good girl and we want to hide being a bad girl because we want to be, don't want to be punished and we want to be rewarded. We've got to grow up, okay? We are the boss. We are the boss. My mother used to say, Catholic mummy, virtue has its own rewards. That's what Buddha's saying. This is where we really become accountable. This is the meaning of karma. It's actually quite intense. It's quite powerful. We're the boss. Because Buddha's saying every millisecond of what we think and do and say produces me. It's like he would have loved the term programming. Every millisecond we are programming ourselves. Every millisecond. This is what Buddha's saying. Now, what's interesting, when it comes to intellectual and creative pursuits, we understand that. You know, if you can play brilliant piano, I go, wow, why are you good at piano? Well, you say, well, I have practiced it for 10 years, Rabina. What do you think? I mean, it's obvious why you're good at piano. Why are you good at anger? Oh, that's his fault. <laughs> we have a different set of rules when it comes to emotional habits or creative habits. So it's kind of interesting. For Buddha, they're all equal. They're just a bunch of tendencies you got born with, you know. The tendency to kill or lie or be good at music or, or get angry or jealous. They're just mental tendencies. And this is one of the ways that karma works for the Buddha. And the karma is a, is a name. It's like a big stick. We use it like a big stick to beat ourselves. But it's a word that really is so referring to this process of how we program ourselves moment by moment. It's Buddha's view that we are actually the creators of ourselves. We come into this life from the first second of conception. 
completely programmed with our tendencies and all, all, all the stuff that even is going to happen to us in this world. You know? It's a totally fascinating view if we unpack it, not just hear it in a superstitious way, but just how we use the word, very superstitious way. You know? So it's quite intense what Buddha's saying. That's why he doesn't posit a creator. He's not just being argumentative. It's a profound view that he's saying. You know? So the implication is incredible, so tasty. We grow up. We start to take responsibility. We start recognising that I am sick of suffering first. Forget the suffering of others. Forget compassion. That's too advanced. We've got to first realise, this is the Four Noble Truths, that you know what? I'm up to here with suffering. I'm fed up to the teeth with suffering. And guess what the causes are? My ridiculous rubbish. But guess what? My happiness is also the fruit of my past actions as well. So we've got to remember the good as well. But we tend to get addicted to the bad, you know. I joke when I say this, but I mean it. In all these years I've been a Buddhist and, you know, having to talk about this stuff all the time. Happily, I enjoy doing it. I've never yet ever, 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 <laughs> ever had a person ask the question, Rabina, why do good things happen? <laughs> do you understand? We only ever ask about the bad things. It's very profound. This indicates a lot about apathetic ego. The irony of ego is that it's, it's, it's the stuff that's addicted to the misery, you know. This is the irony of ego. Buddha's deal. The unhappy, deluded sense of a separate me that gets attached. And, and this, I, I forgot to go into the hierarchy, so I'll go back to the hierarchy. I'm sorry, I forgot. I rave on a bit. So back in this hierarchy of these neuroses, okay. There's the root delusion, the root delusion that's very tasty, is this primordial, so primordial, we don't really even have a term for it in our psychology. It's this primordially mistaken, neurotic sense of a lonely, bereft, panic-stricken me, deep in our bones, on the basis of which there is naturally this massive feeling of dissatisfaction, of never being enough, never having enough. No matter what I get or do or achieve, it's never enough. It's our default mode. That's the deepest energy of the next delusion, the main voice of ego, which is attachment, craving, you know, that one. Hunger, hankering. So then uh, on the basis of this dissatisfaction, we then hanker after something. And the first obvious objects are the objects of the senses. So the next energy, and all this is a function of attachment. It's multifaceted. The next level of attachment is that it then gloms onto some object, depending on the habit, you know, and then what it does is, and this is the killer, it make, that attachment makes the object look, look way more delicious than it really is. It then causes us to manipulate to get it, to completely anticipate the getting of it, the expectation, and then the getting of it, and then the expectation of getting happy. And then if it's going to be especially physical things, we then possess it. You know? All of this, Buddha says, are the series of levels of it at which attachment function. And because it's a delusion, it's a lie, it's a misconception, it's all fantasy. So the only consequence of this is disappointment because you don't get what you think attachment what You don't get what attachment thinks. Easy to say, but this is the, the next delusion on the basis of ego grasping. Attachment is its main voice. And this is like the motor that propels us every millisecond, underneath like a motor propelling us every millisecond, every second. And we're totally instinctively programmed with this, Buddha would say, from countless lives. That's why it's so instinctive. On the base, so attachment is like this motor that's propelling us every second. And it's, it's this junkie within us that only can bear the nice things. Or it's the junkie in us that is craving to get what I want, the supposed I, every millisecond. And it's panic stricken. So, the, and guess what? Is the next one is up on the basis of this attachment not getting what it wants, on the basis of this attachment being thwarted, which is a thousand times a day, but very low levels of it. That's called aversion. The strong level of aversion is anger. The internalized level of aversion is depression, despair, hopelessness. These are words are so simple, but they're so profound. They're so nuanced. And the only way we're going to get into the details of this is by lo looking into our own minds in a very detailed way, being our own therapists. Not kidding. Not a cause you have to argue with it. That, that, that was my question. Whether it's better to argue with it or let it go away. But why would it go away if you don't decide to make it go away? It's your mind. And they're running a thousand second thoughts a second. So you've got to decide. You've got to, I mean, okay. Thoughts are more subtle than we think. And some of them just might go away. But how marvellous you can see it. So whatever, darling, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing it. <laughs>
Okay. I'm so sorry, people. It's time to go home, I think. It's a bit late. Anyway, go if you have to. Never mind. Yes, go on. What is a precursor for attachment? What, darling? What is a precursor for attachment? The precursor of attachment. What do you mean? Like, what is... Huh? What, where does it start, attachment? Like? Where does it start? You mean... What do you mean by where does it start? Attachment is the main disease, Buddha says, that we have that runs our lives. And we're born with it from countless lives of having it in the past. It's a very deep, instinctive, deluded state of mind that manifests as neediness and hunger and craving and never stopping wanting something because we feel like we're lacking something. It's a very deep primordial energy in all of us, in animals and every being. It's quite subtle for Buddha, the way it works, this stuff. And it's from count it's very old habit. So the precursor meaning, where was the first moment of attachment, do you mean? Yeah, what, yeah what's, hmm? what is the thing that uh, keeps making you attached to... to oh, no, okay. The deepest delusion is Buddha's view, which is very subtle, is this, a, a mistaken sense of an I. This vivid kind of main player in our head is I, isn't it? And the feeling of this energy of this I is it's always dissatisfied. Always thinking something's missing, always dissatisfied, always needy. This is the energy of attachment. And the cause of it is just the habit of having had it before. There's no one thing that triggers it, that causes it to start. I think our question and answers, it's a very, very, very subtle, actually. We can see it at grosser levels. But it, it actually, its energy is very, very subtle. The way Buddhism talks, until we're very advanced spiritually, we're going to have it at subtle levels. It's quite, the word is kind of cute in a way, but it goes to really subtle, more primordial levels than we can even think of. We don't talk about it like this in our Western culture at all. It's quite subtle and nuanced, the way Buddhism psychology talks about it. Thank you. Okay. I think time to go home, isn't it? Yes, here. One question here. Then we finish. <coughs> here. Oh, here. Yes, there. <laughs> Go on. Yes, darling. Um, when you were, could you explain Bit closer to the mic, I can't hear you. Can you please clarify the neutral states you were talking about? Yeah, just concentration, good memory, vigilance. There's one called recognition, uh, discrimination. You can see there's yellow, there's blue, there's pink, there's girl, there's boy. The it's kind of, these are technical states of our mind that aren't virtuous in their character, nor are they deluded or neurotic. They're like, I like to call them the mechanics of our mind. And they cause anyone to function, to do anything well, whether you're good or bad. So a sniper, wouldn't you agree a sniper reads in really good focus? You'd agree, wouldn't you? Well, so does a meditator. So focus in itself is neither good nor bad in the virtuous and non-virtuous sense. They're very specific labels in Buddhist psychology. The non-virtues are neurotic and deluded and eye-based. The virtues are compassionate and empathetic and other-based. The, the, the neutral ones are just like these mechanics, mechanics of the mind. I like to put, call it that. Good people and bad people need them. Do you understand now a bit? Concentration. Everyone needs concentration. Everyone needs to not, have, not forget what you're doing from moment to moment, which is mindfulness. Everybody needs discrimination. Is that black or is that blue? Everybody needs these many parts of our mind all working over time just to make us function reasonably in a day. Yeah, they're all states of mind. Yeah, they're all conceptual states of mind. Yes, absolutely. These are all in the mental consciousness and they're all in all conceptual states of mind. The level we function in the mental consciousness for the Buddha is all necessarily conceptual, including all the emotions. Then we've got subtle level of mind when we go beyond conceptual. That's what they call perception. That's when we get to med subtle meditation, beyond conceptual. That's a bit abstract for our mind, you know. Do you understand? Yeah. Over here, one more and then we go home. Or wherever you're going. Uh, sorry, it's, it's One more question. Nice One more question. One more question. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. He's the boss. I forgot. Because <laughs> Contrary to appearances, he's the boss. I'm happy. I don't need a rest. I'm all right. <laughs> Time to go home. It's late. Thank you, though, for your very kind. Well, yes, sweetheart. Go. No, no worries. I just wanted to. Bit close to the mic. In your mind? Well, your thoughts? No, more of a feeling. Well, huh? more of a feeling, like feeling in the body. Like you're in meditation and the sensations and things happening around. What, darling? Go close to the mic, darling. Sorry. You're, say you're in meditation and you're 
meditation. So you're doing focusing meditation. You're concentrating. It's more than what? It's more of an open meditation. I don't know what that means. What's that mean? There's so many kinds. What do you mean? Um, uh, more of an open Vipassana type of meditation. So just... Uh, Watching what's happening. Yeah. Okay, go on. So then what happens? Um, and a feeling in your body. Then, then body. question... I don't know. You don't tell me. What's your purpose in your meditation? What's the, the what's the purpose of it? The purpose is to see it, to understand it. Okay, then. Well, it's like, okay, good. This is good. Okay, let's say I don't know anything about botany and I'm trying to be mindful of the garden. That'd be very helpful, wouldn't it? And I can even draw a picture of it. If I have a really good mindfulness. I can even draw a beautiful picture of your garden, right? But what good is that? Well, if I can't label, is it a weed or a herb? So what's the point of seeing something if you can't label it? What's the point? Oh, I've got a feeling. Oh, there's, there's a flower. Oh, there's, there's a green thing. What's it called? I don't know. Well, that's being stupid. You've got to know the only reason to notice something is to know what to do with it. Is that not what the action point is? Maybe not in that meditation. Maybe you just observe and you keep focused. But then you, the only reason to look at something is to comprehend it, surely. Yeah, but then if you do see that, and huh? you can do some different self-talk around it or whatever. Or when? You do it in your meditation? But that's up to you to decide what kind of meditation you do. You can do any meditation you like. You can make up your own. I don't care. But so you've got to decide what the purpose of that meditation is and then the answer will come. So if you're doing just concentration, the job is not to start going into it. The job is observe it at the side of your mind. But then you see it and you can learn to look at it later. So then, Isn't it? Then you look at it outside of well, yeah, of course. So you decide what the purpose of the meditation is. If it's just to focus your mind to get single point of concentration, you do not engage any discursive thought whatsoever. But the bonus, why my point is that we do a bit of, you know, focusing meditation every day. The, 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 you might not get much single pointedness, forget that. But the bonus that comes is that you start to hear the crazy thoughts. And, you, and then you're, oh, that's interesting, look at that. You know, these roommates start popping up. That's great, because now you know what to deal with. So be glad you hear all your crazy thoughts. Be happy. Don't wish that'll go away. That's ridiculous, you know, because they're all there. And we're just waking them up. Do you understand my point? So we've got to have really courageous to look at our thoughts, not be afraid of any of them. This is very powerful, I tell you. That's why we can really misuse the meaning of meditation to make it all go away and be all like these peaceful morons, you know. <laughs>